Imagine that you're riding your motorcycle and you're slowing down to come to a stop. You look in your rearview mirror and you see a car coming up behind you and he's coming up way too fast. You know that he can't slow down or stop in time. Is there anything you can do as a motorcycle rider to prevent a rear end collision? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today on our very first episode of Cruise Man's Garage Talk. Now, you can help make this podcast a success by doing a couple of simple things. Please take a second to click that subscribe button down below. Make sure you click the notification bell. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. That really does help our YouTube rankings. So let's get started. Most of you guys know, if you follow my channel, you know how excited I am and passionate I am about this break-free helmet light. I've got two of them, one for each of my helmets. In fact, I never ride the motorcycle without one, and I really am a big believer in it because I know how how rear-end collisions can really... they're pretty prevalent and they can really be bad news. So I'm a big believer. So that's why I'm so excited. My very first guest on my first episode of this new podcast is Alex Archangelski. He is the CEO and founder, one of the co-founders of Break Free Technologies. And Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> and the people audience doesn't know we already went through a lot of this because i forgot to hit the record button so uh first time i'm learning i screwed up so i need a producer i need somebody sitting over here making sure i do all this stuff uh alex i know you and your founders of the company are all motorcycle riders and you went through before we hit record you went through some of the different bikes you own and I was really the most interesting part to me was to kind of get an idea of how Break Free even became an idea, a germination of an idea. How, did, who came up with it, and you know, how did that start? You were telling, you were in the middle of telling me that story. It started as a internship right after I graduated from uh, San Jose State. I didn't want to hop back into the entrepreneur, uh, into the corporate grind, and I wanted to try something new, possibly um, learn more about entrepreneurship. So I asked my entrepreneurship professor to see if there's any internship opportunities for me out there. And she connected me with an alum from San Jose State who is a successful entrepreneur in his own right. He's been doing his own thing for you know, 30, 40 years at that point. And uh, he kind of took me under his wing as a marketing intern and um, had me working on a whole bunch of different projects for him. And one of those projects ended up becoming break free over time. So I interned with him for about a year and um, kind of in the last six months, we started uh, exploring the idea of this autonomous light that would go on the back of a car's window because um, the uh, that entrepreneur almost got rear-ended on the freeway because he hit the brakes real hard and the person behind him couldn't tell how fast he was slowing down so he kind of envisioned this light bar that would go in the back of the car's window and it would somehow automatically detect when you're decelerating quickly and so my job was to go out and research the opportunity find out what the competitors are um, you know has something like this been attempted before uh, is it successful and how it can be improved and you know just the whole the whole thing um, so he was walking me through kind of his process of uh, thinking about ideas and developing products he mentioned himself that he kind of skipped a few steps and uh, already got a prototype made it was like a really basic um, just LED bar with an accelerometer attached to it and he thought that that might work and um, long story short I ended up uh, doing a lot of research and ended up coming to the conclusion or telling him that I think that this is not really a viable product for the automotive industry because most drivers feel pretty safe in the steel cage that they ride in. They already have a lot of brake lights and some cars uh, were starting to come out with um, 
brake lights that would engage, you know, blink or do something extra when you're uh, hitting the brakes or holding the brakes for a certain amount of time. So I told him, hey, why don't, you know, why don't we look at the motorcycle market uh, and see if maybe this idea has legs in that space because I've been commuting to college, you know, for three years and the, in, in San Jose, in the Bay Area where I was growing up, um, there's just a lot of traffic. Uh, people are always rushing to work to wherever they're going and you know uh, riding a motorcycle is really dangerous I remembered from uh, my MSF class my instructor telling me that you know just pretend like you're invisible out there people don't see you so I kind of took that bit of knowledge and try to combine it with what uh, I don't know what to call him he's uh, he, he, he was my original co-founder for the idea of break free he's no longer with the company or anything um, we kind of parted ways, but essentially, you know, we decided that, you know, let's explore it. And, um, I've gone to a bunch of different trade shows. I've interviewed a lot of people in the industry, I've been walking around to all these different dealerships in the area, trying to kind of pitch them on this idea of like, Hey, what do you think about this autonomous light that would somehow wirelessly activate, give the rider more visibility. And at that point we didn't really know exactly how we were going to implement it. We didn't know if it was going to be a vest or if it was going to be like something that you add to the bike or to the rider. Um, eventually came to the conclusion that I think it would make the most sense to attach it to the helmet because it's the highest point in the rider and it's the most visible part of the rider. And um, yeah, it just kind of evolved from there. Okay, great. Yeah, you know, the the brake free light was not the very first helmet light I've tested and reviewed. Right. There was another one from another company which was quite a bit bulkier mm -hmm. and it uh, required that you do some wiring to the motorcycle. Yeah. And I thought, you know, because I think it might have even, I'm not even sure if it had integrated turn signals. I think it just keyed off the brake light. I don't remember now. It's been so long. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I thought was really genius about Brake Free was you didn't go all in on that type of technology. You're just focused primarily on the motorcycle slowing down. And I don't think that other light had that feature. It, it was purely a brake light. That's what appealed to me was this, as soon as you almost, I mean, I think we let off the throttle, you know, just that little sensitivity of deceleration, the light will begin to flash or come on, however you have it set, because there's three, or, I think there's three different settings. Right. I thought that was really a genius because you don't have to wire anything. You don't have to install anything. You don't have to hook anything up. You can go from one motorcycle to another, and it, it works the same way. I thought that was really genius. So whoever your designer is, I, I don't know if that was yourself or somebody else on your team that did the, uh, the ergonomics of the, of the light, but it's uh, really, really well done. Thank you. I appreciate that. I can't take credit for the design. Um, that was my co-founder, Ian. He's a professional uh, industrial designer, and um, he works for a big OEM currently. I'm not sure if he would be excited for me to share where, but okay. um, yeah, he graduated from the Detroit Automotive School of uh, Design, and he's gotten his master's in transportation design in, in Europe and worked for a number of different um, agencies where he's designed products for KTM and a few other um, big companies and yeah he's currently working full-time as an industrial designer and moonlighting break free still very cool <laughs> so, yeah, now, yeah, can you can you tell me any is there anything else that you can think of that distinguishes break free from other either lights that are integrated there are a few helmets out there that have a light integrated for example i have a senna impulse helmet mm -hmm. and it's got a light that comes on when you turn on the headset but it doesn't really do anything it doesn't have a decelerometer you know it, it just is a light right. uh, but there, i know there's a couple of other helmet lights out there what what is there that that you feel like is the the secret sauce to this product right um, so when we started out, I, you know, I did a ton of research to figure out and understand the space. I knew that there were a couple of different products out there, even at the time when we were thinking about the idea. Uh, what I didn't understand was why has the idea never taken off? 
uh, the number of people that I've interviewed, they all said that yes, motorcyclists are hard to see, improvements in visibility are crucial, it's going to uh, make for a uh, much safer uh, experience riding a motorcycle where people can actually see you because they're not looking for motorcyclists. So uh, when we were kind of keying in on the idea and exactly what would be the, the main um, thing that we were going to focus on, it was going to be the fact that we wanted to make it completely wireless. We saw that the competitive products um, required wiring into the motorcycle. I bought a couple of them. I tried to install them myself on my um, Honda VFR that I had at the time. And, um, you know, it took me a solid hour. I'm not super mechanically inclined, so I'm sure somebody could do it much faster. But still, the process was kind of tedious. You had to splice wires. I know that some motorcycles have a much harder time with splice and wires because it messes up the um, that main computer that kind of processes all the signals. So we really focused on, uh, you put all of our eggs in the basket of like, we need to make this completely wireless because I feel I felt like the, the barrier to, to folks really adopting the product was the fact that, you know, the installation was hard. Some of them were kind of stuck with the one helmet that you could install it on, meaning that it had like a 3M tape on the back of it and you stick it on and that's the helmet you're using it with. And um, you're stuck with using it on one bike and then uh, a few lights were just really, really hard to see during daytime, so they were not very functional during daytime. And you know, at night, sure, you could see some LEDs and stuff. Um, so we wanted to key in on on the fact that we wanted to, the installation process to be as simple as possible, and we wanted to kind of get away from the idea of safety not being that sexy, not not um, something that you kind of have to do, not so much that you'd want to do it. So we wanted the design of the product to be kind of futuristic um, kind of match up with the aesthetic of the bikes that we thought that would be um, or, or the type of rider that would be using the, the product. So we really wanted to make design, function, and the installation process kind of as easy as possible. Right. You know, the, the first time I learned about Break Free mm -hmm. was on my girlfriend and I watched Shark Tank. Awesome. And I saw you guys, you and one of your partners or one of your co-founders on Shark Tank presenting the Break Free. And I, I mean, I told Ricky when I, we saw it, I said, this is genius. This is a great idea. And uh, you were able to get a deal with, mm -hmm. I believe it was Mark Cuban and Robert. I'll give you 200000 for 20%. That's my offer. This is going to be on the back of every helmet out there because there's a passion to riding motorcycles, and this gives you that safety. Absolutely. Thank Good you style for that. to match it. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> I'm going to be using it, Henry. So, what do you think of that offer? Uh, I think uh, Mark's been a little. Quiet. Yeah. Look. Would you guys want to collaborate together? I think the brick and mortar and the online I'm, together. I'm open to it. I only have one condition: when we're riding the bike. Mark has to get on the back and hug me. <laughs> That's fair enough. Are you this okay? says well, a whole lot more about you than it does me, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm open to it. Okay, let's yeah, go. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, nice. All right. Oh, yes. 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 Congratulations, Thank man. You. Thank, Thank you so much. Guys. Great job. Awesome. Tell me a little bit about how that worked out. I mean, is are they still part of the company? Are they still involved? Or did you guys part ways? How how's that worked? And and what was your experience like with the Shark Tank world? Sure. Um, well, we had quite a unique experience on Shark Tank as far as I understand it compared to all the other companies that have been on there. Um, we were on Shark Tank in kind of towards the end of 2019. We um, shot the episode at the end of September of 2019 and at that point we have already crowdfunded the project. We've raised enough money to get us through the development phase to get the tooling made and do all the required testing and uh, validation and beta testing with our crowdfunders. And so we were, we were feeling pretty confident that that was going to be the product that we're going to go to market with. We were pretty much ready to um, start the mass production for the pre-orders that we had through crowdfunding, fulfill all of those and, and uh, go to market. So that was the point at which you saw us on Shark Tank back in 2019. But 
you'll say, but wait, I saw the episode maybe in 2020. So um, that's where the long, complicated part comes. We did get a deal on the show. We got a deal with Mark and Robert. And, um, you know, we started the whole process of due diligence and uh, going through the steps of, you know, making sure everything matched up. And, um, you know, after the show, we didn't really talk to Mark Cuban or Robert pretty much ever. It was just their uh, business their analysts team. and their, uh, their teams kind of interacting with us via email. And we had two, two phone calls. Um, they essentially kind of sat on the information for months. Um, and we haven't really heard back from them other than a couple of, you know, quick line responses to our updates and, um, around January, that's when I was starting to kind of get a little bit worried because, you know, the motorcycle riding season is approaching. We were really on the show to get the funding, to kick off production, to get that next production run after we fulfilled all the pre-orders, which we had the money to do, but we didn't have the money to start that first production run. Uh, to get the product out into the market and start marketing the product correctly. So we were relying on Shark's, the, the Shark Tank deal to really like help us optimize our market, go to market strategy, um, make the right connections in the beginning so that, we, we, that way we can kind of avoid some of the uh, pitfalls that we, we didn't know what we didn't know and we figured the Shark Tank folks would know uh, how to do this better than we would and right. the funding would help us kind of get started and you know we would just catapult out into the market and everything would be great um unfortunately the deal did end up falling apart in february of 2020 um that's when the pandemic started it was kind of an unceremonious ending where we got kind of a generic email saying that they're not going to move forward with the deal and um, wish us best of luck. And we really were just kind of didn't really understand why it fell apart. And I felt like they already knew everything about the, the deal. And um, while we were on the show pitching, we kind of shared all of the critical information about the company, the, the fun, uh, funding, uh, the stage of the company and everything. And when it kind of all fell apart, it was a big shock to us uh, because, mm. you know, we were so excited to get everything going and, you know, we would have the help of the sharks to get us through that beginning part. And um, when it fell apart, we were just, we just didn't really know what to do. And two weeks later, the producers called us and told us that the show is actually not going to air because they, uh, the, uh, the company that uh, buys episodes and puts them on the air, they decided that they weren't going to buy as many episodes, so they had to cut somebody, and unfortunately, we were it. The timing was a little weird because it was two weeks apart from the deal falling apart to then finding out that the show's not going to air, and we were, we were you know, pre feeling pretty low. But, you know, the team rallied, and we decided that, like, you know what, we don't need the Sharks. We're going to keep going. We're going to figure out how to do this. Um, Finding funding in 2020 was really hard. Uh, there's no, uh, you can't really kind of ramp up to find another investor on the spot. It's kind of months long process. And, you know, we were looking at all kinds of options. Um, eventually we ended up um, getting some funding from one of our co-founders. He put in some money into the company to get a small production run going. So we started out with that and, um, you know, in May of uh, 2020, the show actually called us back and then they told us, you know, something that's never happened before is happening. Uh, the, sh the, the show decided to buy the episode and air it the following season. Hmm. And um, Interesting. So at that point, we were kind of like, well, uh, I'm not going to count on that actually happening, but it would be great if it did. Sure. Uh, so it did finally air in December of 2020. So everything kind of worked out. The, in the best way possible. It just it was really hard to see that at the time because it was kind of pretty depressing to have everything kind of feel like it's right there, right ready yeah. to go. To uh, um, everything's going to work out, and then all of a sudden everything kind of falls apart. Um, but that's entrepreneurship. I feel like it's just a crazy roller coaster ride, and you just got to enjoy the. Yeah, high and, and by the time so by the time the show actually aired, you were already in production. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. So that's so that, that worked we're, out. Yeah. And I mean, this is national television. It's a popular show. I assume oh, yeah. you got a bump from that. Oh yeah, it was huge. Um, the Shark Tank effect is certainly real. Um, if the episode does air, um, 
it, it does have a huge effect on uh, publicity and you know a lot of people see your products and um, a lot of great great things happen afterwards uh, right. I think in 2020 that whole year you know we were limited with funds that we could produce units with and we were not paying ourselves anything uh, we were just basically taking everything that we would make from the sale of the units that we had and then put it right into the next production run so i think we were on production run number two or three um, um, by the time the show aired um, luckily we had some inventory by the time it was airing we had about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in sales um, throughout you know we, we launched our website in uh, march of 2020 and uh, started shipping units in May of 2022. Everybody that was buying them from their website. So we had 250,000 going into Shark Tank, but before it aired, and then once it aired, in the two weeks um, after, we've made basically another 250,000 dollars just from the Shark Tank bump. It wow. was quite insane to to watch the uh, the Shopify uh, data come in uh, real time, and you could see like the the map of the United States lighting up on the oh, east really? coast because they air the, the show on the east coast up. and it goes over and then to the west coast. Wow. And there's just I, I did this whole like video of a time lapse um, of a camera facing my laptop screen with the Shopify uh, dashboard pulled up, and it was just it was crazy to see that amount wow. of sales come through in that short a time. It was, so it, was really it exciting. didn't turn out to have some value. I mean, I know you wanted the deal with the sharks, but I think right. more than the money. Uh, that you know the investment from the sharks is that knowledge and experience you're hoping to gain from them and the connections and like you said avoid the pitfalls of all the different things that they've already done so yeah it's kind of disappointing that you never really even got to deal with them you just pretty much deal with their team and their I, I figured that probably could be the case I just wasn't sure I wonder how many deals turn out like that where on the show, you see that they get a deal, but then it never actually goes through. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it happens. Yeah, um, I didn't really know the answer to that question before we were on Shark Tank, but afterwards I was networking with a few uh, companies that have been on the show. And yeah, it's, it's more common than I thought, um, but you know, it just didn't work out for us. Um, I, I don't know exactly their logic or reasoning why they've backed out of the deal when they did. I'm guessing the pandemic really scared a lot of people and nobody yeah. really knew how it was going to work out and investing in something like our product where you know it doesn't have a huge uh, tra uh, track record of sales or anything like that so um, I'm sure it was a risk for them so now I don't uh, know if you're I don't know if you experienced this during the pandemic I know I can just go by my YouTube channel and my YouTube channel just blew up you know during the pandemic because a lot of people were staying home they weren't working and uh, a lot of people were buying our videos and, and working on their motorcycles. Did you did you notice anything like that on your side of the business? Were more people riding their motorcycles and being more? Did you did you see a bump or did you see a dip during the COVID thing? How did that work? Well, we didn't really know what we were expecting because we didn't have kind of a track record of you know it's like you know last year before the pandemic we had this many sales and now we have more um, everything was new to us but uh, I, I do think that the pandemic did increase uh, the amount of folks that were riding uh, because I think it was probably safer to ride than it is to like take public transport or it was probably easier to commute around and to not be around people so much so I think uh, I think I did notice an increase um, well, we had pretty good sales throughout the pandemic, which I was nervous about because I didn't really know how it was going to go right. with the pandemic happening. And um, the pandemic did have its own set of challenges. Um, it felt like we were constantly kind of trying to react to the the latest thing that's happening, like components becoming really hard to get because of um, logistical issues. and. Um, component shortages um, there's a there's a lot happening but we managed to kind of overcome all of those channel challenges one at a time and um, I think we came out stronger for it to be honest it, it was it was a really odd time to start a business for sure yeah <laughs> I would like to talk a second about the design because I've got the white model here mm -hmm. which Thank you for coming out with the white model <laughs> <You're> <laughs> because welcome. I always wear a white helmet so it, it matches it's beautiful and uh, really an elegant design it's got the soft touch kind of a rubbery feel plastic to it 
you know, it, it, it just it molds to my helmet anyway, and you've got a very unique mounting system. And I want to ask you just a little bit. I mean, this system is completely waterproof. How do you deal with fitment issues on a variety of helmets? I'm sure there's a few helmets out there where it's almost impossible because they always have weird fins on the back and stuff like that. I mean, you've got a pretty universal mount that fits both of my helmets. I have an HJC and a Senna, and it fits both of those. But I'm, I've had people ask me that question before, that they have a, I don't know if it's a shark or some other kind of helmet. and it. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Yeah, we've come out with... Uh two different mounts uh, since we launched the product. Um, the initial kind of design phase of it, it, you know, I feel like I'm glad that we took the amount of time that we did to really test fitment and trying to find that common shape that would fit the most helmets. Uh, we didn't go with like the smallest possible uh, products. You know, we wanted to maximize the visual footprint of the light on the helmet, but also fit as many helmets as we can on the market so we've it was kind of an iterative process to where we've designed a shape we would 3d print a whole bunch of different versions and i would just go to a motorcycle shop uh, there was a cycle gear down the street from uh, my house in san jose i would just take you know four five six of these uh, uh back plates of this <laughs> this part where it's just 3D printed curve and I would go and test it on all these different sizes and models and, and trying to figure out, okay, well, this, uh, this shape interferes with things. It's too flat or too, too, uh, too curved. And then eventually we've kind of settled on, on the shape that we came up with. And I, you know, that part had to be figured out before the rest of the unit because, um, everything kind of matches up to the curve of the back of the unit. So I think we did a, really good job i was really nervous about that part i i you know there's probably a whole bunch of helmets that i couldn't find in in the shops or uh you know who knows what helmets uh companies come out with in the future so it's um, i was nervous about that but i think we did a really good job with the universal mount initially because i think it fit about you know somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the helmets that we tested them on and um, some of the helmets that we did run into issues with were um, where you had either vents or um, spoilers or something like that that's protruding out from the helmet that you the we had to clear and that's when we came out with the excel mount which is just five millimeters thicker than the uh, universal mount and what it does is it basically just offsets the unit uh, from the helmet a little bit so that the mount could uh, clip into the unit itself and um, now we're including the excel mount in all of our um, products so that way out of the box you're pretty much almost guaranteed that you're going to be able to install it on at least one helmet right. um, and uh, we then also came out with the rf 1400 mount because showy changed up the design of their uh, really popular helmet um, we had the rf 1200 as kind of like it was in a lot of our marketing photos and, and our indiegogo video and everything and if uh, our unit fits that helmet like a glove but all of a sudden the rf 1400 had that um, curvature that was just not matching up with brake free so we had to we decided to come out with a mount just for that helmet so that way it could sit in the optimal spot on the helmet kind of lower down on the helmet so that way it's not shining upwards as much as straight right. back and um, yeah, so I think that that's kind of the approach that we're going to be taking if we're running into more fitment issues. Um, right now, like the only r real issue that we have currently with uh, fitment are helmets where they come to a point, kind of a vertical ridge on the helmet. Right. Uh, there are like a handful of helmets that um, have that design and um, there are workarounds. They're, you know, not ideal. Uh, there's uh, there's this product called Sugru, which is like a moldable um, yeah, epoxy. I've used and, it. <laughs> um, that could replace the adhesive on the back of the mount, and then you could use that uh, moldable glue to kind of create a custom shape and fitment around certain features. But yeah, I mean, I think we'll uh, eventually end up coming out with a mount that addresses the kind of that vertical ridge um, as well. So we're we're really trying to make it fit pretty much everything out there. Do you have any data to suggest, uh, like, what type of rider is more likely to buy brake-free? Is it, is it 
mostly sport riders, adventure tour. I mean, adventure tour, they do a lot of off-road, so they may not feel like they need it as much. But what what type of riding, what type of uh, motorcycle, what type of helmet is, or do you even have that data? Do you even know? We had some initial data when we were doing the crowdfunding. Um, when we completed the funding, we were using a system called Backer Kit, which allowed us to send out surveys to all of our backers. What type of motorcycle do they ride? You know, their age, the type of riding that they do, how many hours do they spend on a bike in a week? Um, so that kind of uh, backed up our assumption that it's mostly going to be sports, uh, sports bike riders, uh, adventure riders, um, folks that are you know riding long distance or spend a lot of time on the bike commuting. That's kind of what we found out early on. We're currently not um, collecting uh, survey data from, from our customers right now, but what we could tell from uh, our ads on Facebook and Instagram and Google, the age group that tends to be buying our product the most is between 45 and 54 and 55 and 65 seems to be like the kind of the sweet spot for us right now. Uh, but we're also seeing a lot of new riders learning about our product. We have um, a pretty big initiative to try and get more uh, schools uh, that teach, you know, MSF type of classes, uh, writing classes, uh, to, to get the product into the hands of instructors and, you know, uh, kind of demo the product if, if they get asked about it. Uh, different states kind of have different laws about what the instructors can and can't do. But if the students, it, it's a highly visual product and it's unusual enough to where a lot of people ask you about it. So a lot of instructors get a lot of questions about uh, their lights and they approach us, uh, they approached us in the beginning, but now we're doing more of an effort to, to reach out to more schools working with uh, Total Control currently in California. Uh, they, they run the uh, writer program there. Uh, there's quite a few schools now that um, that work with us and so we're trying to get writers aware of our product early on so that way they can start out writing safely and you know being seen out there because you know I'm, I'm sure as a new writer you're worried about uh, a lot of things other than yeah. you know uh, making sure the guy behind you is slowing down enough and you know I'm sure you're just working through the mechanics of writing more so than you're actually defensively scanning the road and making sure nobody's uh, going to run you over. We've had, we sponsored a, a rider who used it in the Baja 1000 race. Um, he's local here to me in Colorado. He approached us because he was looking for a sponsorship and he wanted to um, ride with our light on the back of his helmet because trophy trucks can't really see you that well and you know right. getting run over by a trophy truck in the middle of the desert is not fun and no. all they they're required to have is kind of a small blue light on, on the back of you and so he he wanted to use our product on on his helmet and uh, it survived the Baja 1000 so it's kind of a testament to the to the mounting system that uh, my co-founder designed uh, but yeah it was really effective and he he's he swears by it and rides on the street with it and, and off-road so yeah lots of different markets that we didn't kind of foresee in the beginning uh, a lot of snowmobile riders are also really uh, interested in our product because um, for trail riding on a snowmobile it's really hard to see uh, the brake lights on a snowmobile because of all the snow that's getting kicked up and right. brake free being really high up it makes you a lot more visible and it's easier to spot you so the do you sell through the dealer channel or do you pretty much sell directly through your website I know just for full disclosure I am a brake free <laughs> affiliate so uh, I always send people to brake free tech dot com slash cruise man yep. but is that your only uh, sales channel or do you sell through dealers how what are your other channels majority of our sales are coming through our e-commerce website um, we have been growing our dealer network over time a lot of the time it's riders going into their local dealership and somebody inevitably at the parts department asking them about that, what's that light on the back of your helmet? And then the conversation starts and then they reach out to, the dealer reach out, they reaches out to us and we send them a dealer kit and get them signed up. And uh, you know, so our dealership network has been growing. We haven't been putting a ton of energy into trying to get new dealers uh, signed up. Um, we are in Psycho Gear and Revzilla does cover, uh, mm -hmm. does uh, carry our products. So, yeah, we're growing that part out. And uh, what can you, just real quick, last topic I think is I want to talk to you a little bit about the battery life because I have never, of course I don't 
It's not like I'm doing an iron butt or anything, but I I have ridden I think maybe up to nine hours, and I've never had an issue with the battery. What yeah. uh, What can you say about the battery? What How is that designed? What's it? How How long is it supposed to last? We wanted to use the best battery that we can get um, into the unit. So kind of with this shape, you could kind of see the battery is actually behind this portion of the unit. Um, it's an 18650 cell. Uh, we picked that one because it is um, the safest one uh, because it's encased in kind of a, uh, a tube that, that prevents it from expanding and contracting or potentially causing issues. Um, we've added a uh, protection circuit to make sure that you can't overcharge it, you can't overheat it. It will, um, it's got those safety measures built in. And um, yeah, it's a massive uh, capacity in there. It's a 3,200 milliamp hour battery. And it's, you know, we claim eight to 12 hours on our website, but in reality, um, we've had folks that have completed the iron butt on a single charge. Really? Wow. And um, yeah, it, it lasts a really long time. Oftentimes, if you're just commuting on the bike, um, you know, maybe what, eight hours a week or something like that, you're charging up the unit maybe every two weeks. Um, so I charge it about as often as I charge up my uh, Cardo that I use. Yeah, we really wanted to uh, bring a quality product to the market. We didn't want to cut corners. Um, we wanted to use high quality battery, high quality sensors, high quality processor, um, high quality LED panels that we've, um, we've designed ourselves. And uh, yeah, we wanted it to be functional. We don't want it to be a gimmick. We want it to be, uh, to, we designed it almost for ourselves uh, as writers. Right. This is kind of what I wanted to see in a product and it ended up surpassing my expectations. The, the hardest part about getting this product out to market has been actually getting the, getting it to work accurately and responsively to, to where it's responding almost, almost before you're even hitting the, hitting the brakes. So the easy way to go about it is to wire a transponder into the bike and go through that whole rigmarole of wiring and splicing things. Um, we wanted to get away from that because we felt like that was preventing people from getting this product or this type of product onto their helmets. So we spent a long time trying to figure out how to make it completely wireless and accurate. So there's a lot of testing that went into the process and uh, we've decided that we wanted to use an accelerometer combined with a gyro. So what the accelerometer is doing is it's determining when you're slowing down, it's detecting that, uh, that force, the, the change in velocity uh, braking. Using the accelerometer by itself, we found out that it was inaccurate. You, uh, the accelerometer doesn't know which way it's heading, which way. Um, so gravity can set it off. So if you look down, the accelerometer would think that's braking. Sometimes going around a corner, that centrifugal force can feel like deceleration to the accelerometer. So we really... Um, kind of created our own solution, which we actually patented, and that's kind of the secret cool. sauce behind BreakFree, is the combination of how we're taking data from the accelerometer and the gyro. The gyro is what's helping the unit actually know which way the motorcycle is heading and ignore all the other head motions. So you could be head checking, you could be rocking out to your song, and it's ignoring all of those rotational forces, allowing the accelerometer to have clean data and, and respond accurately and quickly to, to any time you're deciding so it picks up on engine braking, downshifting, regular braking, and we've even built in a mode where if you're slowing down quickly, the the light will actually do a flashing pattern and then glow solid anytime you're kind of experiencing that emergency braking situation. Well, it must be pretty rewarding and maybe even a little frustrating to know that you've probably saved a ton of lives with this product. Of course, you probably would never know because, you know, you, if you save their life, no, they wouldn't know why maybe or they don't report. Maybe they do report back to you. I know for a fact people do seem to – the cars seem to stay farther back when I'm wearing this product. They they notice it, and I can see when we come to a stoplight or a stop sign, they, they keep a distance, which I didn't ever notice before. So I want to personally thank you for – you know, being part of this product that I think, I personally believe it's the most important safety product that someone can purchase. I think it's 
really that valuable. I believe in it that much. So I just want to encourage everybody out there, if you've enjoyed the show, please give it a thumbs up. I want to thank Alex again for taking the time to join us today out of his busy schedule and to be my very first guest on my yet-to-be-named podcast. (laughs) Somebody will submit a good name. And uh, I want to direct everybody to your website, uh, breakfreetech.com slash cruiseman if you want to be in the affiliate program or just go to his website. So, Alex, thanks again. Much appreciated. And uh, maybe we'll get to do this again in the future. Absolutely. I would love to. Thank you so much, Chris. 